Um, well, yes, the law of attraction also has the other side to it because it's part of the pairs of opposites. And so the law of attraction also implies the law of repulsion as well. So when we're talking about it in the context of the philosophy of karma, we need to look at how this law of attraction and repulsion functions. But I would like, first of all, to talk about the attraction part, because after all, this is the subject tonight. How we get attracted, what attracts us, why we get attracted. What is this phenomenon of the magnetism that attracts us? And of course, which also has the other side, magnetism is attraction as well as repulsion, depending on the polarization. But we, um, we like people who are attractive, attractive, beautiful, attractive character, attractive disposition, attractive characteristics and qualities and other attributes that they may have that attracts us. Because the human being loves beauty in all of its forms. And I think one of the reasons for our um, relationship with beauty is our relationship with the divine, because the supreme being, the divine, the force, the source is primarily beautiful. And there is uh, one of the romantic poets, I think it was John Keats, maybe, who said that beauty is truth, truth is beauty, and that's all you need to know. And so we are drawn to truth, we are drawn to beauty, because it's something about ourselves, as well as the divine, because the essence of a human being is when you are in your truth, when you are in your power, when you are in your beauty, that's your real condition. And we are drawn to that reality. We are drawn to truth. Sometimes we hear about the awful truth or lately the inconvenient truth. But um, nevertheless, if there's something that comes along with the uh, attribute of truth, we're interested. And we live in a world of fake news and all sorts of things that turn out to be false and fraudulent and scams and those things make us feel really bad, especially if we get caught by them. And so we, we love the real, we love the true, we love the beautiful, uh, and we love the authentic. And um, yet, we get deceived. And one of the attributes of attraction is its capacity to deceive. And there are different things in nature which are very beautiful, uh, but which deceive. And this is because there are many predators out there. And some of the predators create some beautiful thing in order to catch their prey. And in nature also, you see so many TV films and movies about nature. And nature is very beautiful, very restful. Even in its fierce form, we're attracted by it. And we're attracted by nature because it's natural, because it's real. Um, because it's where our roots are. And even when we see all the games of nature in terms of 
those things that are attractive for the purpose of capturing. Uh, you see that in especially in the mating season and the birds will, especially the birds of paradise, they will do all sorts of things to attract a mate. So attraction in nature is very much connected with perpetuating everything. And we have this desire to be immortal. And yet we have to come to terms with our mortality. And even then we just want to be immortal. And I think this is because the spirit within is immortal. And when you forget your essence, your spiritual essence, which is the real self, the longing to return to the self is included in this longing for immortality, this longing for beauty, this longing for truth is the urge to be what one is, the urge to return to the essential self. We're also very attracted to the idea of transformation. And in nature, you have this metaphor of the caterpillar who transforms into a butterfly. And we use this metaphor a great deal for what we want to accomplish in our inner work, our personal work. And transformation is also a word that applies to returning to your original essence. Because the truth is that we have moved away from truth, we've moved away from who we really are, and we got ourselves lost and confused and attracted to what is known as Maya. And Maya is... Uh, the wonderful phenomenon of uh, what is not real and which looks real. And in the Indian scriptures, uh, it is said that the greatest architect of the world was Maya. And Maya means uh, the one who can make everything look extraordinary and real and then it becomes not real. So we have in, in uh, architecture, the phenomenon of trompe l'oeil, where you, um, you have beautiful paintings of buildings somewhere on a big wall, and it turns out to be just a painting of a building, but it looks like it's really there. And uh, uh, this is something that um, is a, a great art to give the impression that something is there which isn't. And we like it because if you didn't paint some beautiful picture and make it seem as though it's there, it wouldn't be so interesting, it wouldn't be so attractive, it wouldn't be so special. So we kind of are attracted to the unreal, just as we are attracted to the real, and we play with the fire of getting deceived because there is this attraction of Maya. And Maya also refers to um, desires, um, addictions, something that has a promise and you get taken in by the promise and uh, sometimes really trapped by the promise, even if it never delivers, but there's always this wish, this hope, this um, desire for the ecstasy, the desire for um, entering into a transcendent state, whether it's the attraction of love of the person, the body, the music, the poetry, the food, the drink, the drugs, the high, the rush, all of these things are all part of the attraction of Maya, 
which turns out to be a great deceiver and which ultimately puts us in deep um, chagrin and sorrow and a feeling of betrayal, which we really don't like. But yet, again and again, that power of the attraction of that which is not real uh, has power over us. And so we um, need to understand about our relationship with this incredible magnetic pull. One is the pull to the attraction of Maya, and the other is the pull to the attraction of God. And both of them are very attractive. One of them is real, and one of them isn't. And the real thing is quite discreet. And the unreal thing is quite showy. And we can sometimes get um, caught up in this expression, all that glitters is not gold. And we go for the glitter. <laughs> it turns out to be gold painted plastic, something like that. But the real thing, the real jewel, the real gold is not. Um, glitzy or glamorous and in fact another word for maya is glamour and uh, a glamorous life is attractive but when you get into the details of it there's quite a lot of biopics out there and i find them really very interesting and so i've seen quite a lot of them and you see the reality of the lives of people who are really great musicians, singers, stars, and yet their life is tragic in many, many ways. A few manage to stay free from that, but so many um, go to the great heights of success and fall to the depths of misery because of um, I think not being able to handle the realities of success, not being internally balanced, not being able to stay free from the, the Maya. Uh, the interesting thing about the artist is that you are just as easily the instrument to carry people through your art and music to a transcendent state, which is very spiritual in nature. And yet on the other side, there is this, um, this whole dimension of the glamour and glitz and um, that which is really negative. Um, the corruption, the money, the lust, the the things that really destroy a person. And I think it's connected with power. And power is a very interesting phenomenon, which is extremely attractive. People desire power, influence. Uh, you want to be famous, you want to be an influencer, you want to be recognized, acknowledged, um, worshipped, whatever. This is an attraction. And why does a person desire this? There could be many reasons, but I think all of them have to do with something about the person is fundamentally weak. And um, their integrity is damaged. And their heart maybe broken or uh, turned to stone or something. And this desire for power is some sort of way to compensate for that. And there may be many other reasons also, but that seems to play a role. And um, uh, when someone wants to 
get free from their pain, uh, one of the attractive things is the um, illusion and delusion. You can also say delusions of grandeur. And it's a phenomenon which um, can actually cause a great deal of damage, but it's also, I think, part of this subject of the law of attraction, the, the power. They, they say, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And even knowing that, a person will go for it because the desire for the promise of power without really looking at the caveats, without really looking at what does it take to handle power, without realizing that power is a, like a toxic substance. And um, power in the hands of a weak person is really not good. But yet, um, power by itself is not necessarily bad. And if power is in the hands of a powerful person who knows how to use it without getting corrupted by it or um, taken over by it, uh, which is a very rare individual, but it exists, then that can be used for tremendous benefit of many, many people. So yet, how many people do we know? How many are there who are that clean to be able to hold that power, to hold that influence and fame and everything without getting uh, corrupted by it? And I, I think that that also tells us something about desire because you know, there's, there's also this word greatness, which is connected with it. And there's a saying, you know, some, some people are born great. Uh, some people have greatness thrust upon them. And some people work hard to become great. And this greatness is, I think, connected with the attraction to beauty, the attraction to power, the attraction to do something because if you feel that you are nobody and insignificant you wonder why are you there just being is not enough there is this feeling that you know i have to prove that i'm worthwhile that i'm valuable that i'm important that my life has some kind of meaning and I, I think um, significance is very important. Uh, a person who catches what it means to be significant without necessarily having to have that reflected back to you by accolades and recognitions and so on, uh, that's also something important. And there is the desire to be significant, to do something significant, to, um, I think, to find meaning in life. And uh, that, that's a very important thing. Uh, let me talk a little bit about another part of attraction, which is the expression, like attracts like. And that's a whole different area but it's to do with um, just the phenomenon of in, in people that you tend to relate to people who you find something in common with. Um, you have the same take on life, you have the same life experience, you have many things in common and so you are attracted because of these commonalities and i think this is because there is a desire deep desire in people to find the others who are similar who are like you who have um, 
know, like people talk about looking for a soulmate, um, someone with whom you can be in harmony uh, because you have so many things in common, uh, because people don't really like to be alone. It is uh, the nature of people to form couples and families and groups and um, uh, to be just isolated is not comfortable. And in fact, in, in the, the legal system, you know, if somebody does something really bad, the worst thing you can do is put them in solitary confinement and cut them off from human company. And uh, this is very important that a, a human being should not really be in isolation. And yet um, you also get attracted, and this is another aspect of the law of attraction, and this has to do with the philosophy of karma, you get attracted to others who seem to be just the right ones with so much in common and there's chemistry and you know everything feels right and you get together and you bond and you get close and many things are engaged in together you form a union on some level can be very intense very deep very simple uh, can be a marriage where you really formalize this bond and union and then it turns and that attraction becomes repulsion. And I want to talk about this a little bit because it's the phenomenon of how the law of karma works to um, cause us to come into circumstances where we have an outstanding karmic account with another person. And this is very much something that plays out in, in the attraction where people get together, they fall in love, they adore each other, they only see pink flowers in the sky or something like this, and everything looks absolutely wonderful and the other person looks like the most wonderful thing, the most beautiful thing, the most interesting thing in the world. And then you're tied, and that um, story falls away. And then uh, this, um, your eyes change, and your feelings change, and the interaction changes, but you're bonded, and so you can't get away. And this is where um, the settlement of karma starts to happen. And you experience difficulties, sorrow, suffering, hardship, maybe violence, verbal violence, physical violence, neglect. Um, many, many things happen between people who get tied up with each other. And this also happens um, in another way, which is even more difficult, really, because one thing to be aware about is that we are spiritual beings operating through physical forms and we relate to each other through the physical form and we forget that we are spiritual beings operating through physical forms. We think we're just physical forms operating through physical forms with a spirit somewhere. <laughs> and so when you leave your body, when you die, your body goes but you are the eternal being the spirit and so you will reincarnate somewhere and so there is this law of attraction works there also you will be born into a family where there are outstanding karmic accounts and you see once you're born into a family and you're part of that family it's not very easy to say oh well uh, i don't think i like it here I'll see you later especially a small child although there are many children who have a hard time they run away they get thrown out neglected all kinds of terrible things happen 
to children these days. And many, many people live in or have lived in uh, dysfunctional families. And then you never really learn the art of living in harmony with other people who may be very different. And this is all because of the power of attraction of karma, where there is an outstanding karmic account with someone and you need to um, settle the account. And that is settled through different kinds of difficulties and pain and hardship and so on. It's very difficult for people to come to terms with this aspect of the law of attraction, but it's there. And so we need to include it in the description of the law of attraction. And um, also, when we hear about these things, the question naturally arises, okay, now what do you do when you're in that situation so that you can, you know, minimize the difficulty and pain and come out of it? And so this is also something that we learn about when we study spiritual knowledge and spiritual practice, because the purpose of uh, knowing about all this is to, um, on the one hand, understand that we are not exempt. You know, every single one of us has karmic accounts, which we don't know what they are. We don't know who they're with. And all of us have some or another experience of or situation where we are in some kind of bondage or where there is some kind of suffering of relationship and this can even be with your own body because if your body is sick you can't just say okay i'll get a different one because for that you have to literally die and get born again and you are bound to your body and suicide is not an option this negative karma that would not solve the problem at all. It compounds the problem. And so this is why we need to really understand about spiritual energy, spiritual power, and how to accumulate it, because the purpose of meditation and the accumulation of spiritual energy is to be able to uh, manage the um, the negative power of attraction, the pull of um, negative feelings, negative experiences, and getting caught up in it and suffering. And what happens with you uh, accumulating and practicing and developing spiritual power is that you can manage those things with a um, that you can manage pain without suffering, that you can manage um, different ways that people treat you badly without getting really caught up in it and being able to walk away and um, pick yourself up and get going again and, and handling all these difficulties with the least amount of difficulty and the greatest amount of wisdom and of course personal strength so these are um, very important things to know about which I think a lot of people don't know about because as uh, Elizabeth was saying the law of attraction is uh, a, a subject that's often used and we hear about it a lot and we are um we think that we can take advantage of the law of attraction to attract wealth and attract good people and attract all sorts of things to us uh, without really knowing that there's another side to that coin. And so we kind of walk in rather innocently into all kinds of attraction without understanding there's a price tag. <laughs> we should not buy without looking what's the price. Can you afford to do that? Um, do you have the strength? Do you have the resilience? Do you have the clarity to know what you're getting into? 
And of course, very often we don't. But if you do study these things and look at the whole picture, and you do bring yourself into your personal power, then you are in a much better situation for handling it. And, uh, you know, once you're caught in it, there's no way out except through. You have to go through it. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. So the law of attraction uh, needs to be understood, I think, uh, from, from all of its angles and also knowing that it's part of uh, the pairs of opposites. And there are other pairs of opposites. And in the Indian scripture called the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about the importance of being able to handle the different pairs of opposites without getting caught up in it. And one of them is fame and defamation. So if you're attracted to fame, you will also have to handle defamation. So don't go for fame if you don't know how to handle defamation because you have to have both. Success, so many people, they want success. They want to be a multimillionaire. They want all these things, success. On the other side of success, there is failure. So if you want success, you need to be very aware about that failure will also come along as well. And can you develop this stage called equanimity in the face of the pairs of opposites? And equanimity is something that you achieve by study and practice of spiritual power. And if you do not develop this and cultivate this, when the flip side comes along, you will not be able to manage it. And there's the difficulty. But if you understand and you prepare yourself and you are able to be in a state of equanimity or hold your equilibrium in the face of success and failure and be neutral, uh, then this is real success because you can handle the flip side. Um, there are many different kinds of pairs of opposites, love and hate. Um, can you be neutral in that? Can you maintain your um, principles of love for humanity when you are discriminated against? Uh, there's uh, exams of life and the person of noble character, the person who understands, who has, you know, used their life to accumulate deep understanding of what is humanity and what are the issues that we have to work through, um, you are able to manage these uh, pairs of opposites, the attraction, the repulsion. And when you think about the attraction of God, um, there's even a flip side of that, you see. <laughs> you would think no, God is only beautiful, only true, only um, real. But the flip side of that is the dark night of the soul, the existence of the force of evil. And you have to be able to be neutral about that also because it will come along and attack you. If you go for the highest um, experience, you need to be able to understand that the other side, the dark side, is going to come along and uh, test you. So you have to be up for that as well and not confused by it. So I think um, let's just stop for a moment there and have just a few moments of reflection and just think about these pairs of opposites. 
and uh, what it might be to be in a state of equilibrium, balanced, accepting, accept the rough with the smooth, accept the dark as well as the light, accept the beauty and the ugliness, accept the realities of life, and do your very, very best, even if it's not enough, that's okay. It's never enough. Um, be realistic, as well as holding very high standards and principles. Be committed to be the best that you can be and accept your imperfections, shortcomings. Be detached. There is the dark side, the bright side, and all the grays in between, and it's all one big hole. And honor the beauty, the nobility, the wonder of life while being able to manage the other side, the darkness, the betrayals, the failures, and um, be easy in all of it. Thank you. Elizabeth. I think your mic is muted. Hello. Hello. So is this a good time to engage everyone in a conversation of question and answer? I feel so. I have a few questions to start things uh, rolling. Um, and also, I'd like to invite you all to take this chance. And even in asking the question, uh, you'll realize things uh, for yourself. Um, and the question that I have, and so just you can ask your question in the chat, or you can raise your hand, and I'll unmute you and you can ask uh, live for yourself. So I'm well, that's the invitation. And um, recently, um, I was uh, thinking about this aspect of being neutral in the pairs of opposites, because you would hear this, and it's kind of as old as the hills, that you need to be maintain um, calm, and um, to, I guess you could call it integrity, no matter whether you're getting praised or defamed, whether you claim victory or you have defeat, but that you can stay what I call sitting on the fence. And when I use this term sitting on the fence, for me, it means that you understand this game of the world, the real and the unreal. Mm. <laughs> the isness, the suchness, and then of course the um, the subtle. Mm. And what I had read was that when you find that neutrality or balance was the offering, when you find that balance, then you will know God. That's nice. It, is, it felt really good. And that then you began to understand this game. Because sometimes you might think, well, how can you downplay life? This is important. <laughs> I have deadlines. These are important. I have people to impress. This is important. <laughs> 
Um, but then when we um, take that moment, breathe, sit on the fence, and then you begin to understand this game. So I'm, I was really um, happy to hear you speak on that. Uh, could you elaborate how one can develop discernment, equanimity, and another word you used, a knowing of truth, a, you know, that's worth playing the game. Uh, yeah, well, to me, um, <clears throat> there's nothing really better than experience. And uh, there are songs, I, I can't remember their titles exactly, but um, there are many songs which talk about, I, I think probably the one that really does it the best is The Rose. I think it's one of the ones that you sing, Elizabeth. Um, and, and there are lines like, you know, if you're not prepared to die, you'll never know how to live. And if you're not prepared to, you know, give yourself, you'll never know what is love. And so the, these are sort of going into, walking into places where angels fear to tread. Um, but if you never go there, then you never know <laughs> what you missed, you know, and, and you, you can never really be experienced. You remain kind of theoretical. And I, I think that um, there is really no substitute for experience. Sometimes people I think, well, you know, um, if I if I risk uh, living and loving and dying and, and all the things, I might fail. Okay, but if you don't risk, you'll never know. So I think it's very important to be able to risk. I think we also have to make calculated risks um, because there's a difference between risking in a meaningful way and risking in a reckless way and um, one of them is actually responsible and the other is irresponsible and responsible means that you're um, you know you're clear about what you're what you're doing what you're risking and you also know that it's to find out what your limits are, what the limits of life are, um, to know, uh, like you said, uh, knowing, I think that um, that's very important. And if you fail, you learn from it. People don't really learn that much from succeeding, but they do learn from failing. And um, there's also the aspect of humility. I think that that's there's a difference between theoretical humility and real humility. Because humility is when your ego's on the line and it gets crushed and you come out in one piece better than when you went in because of the ego being full on while you're doing things. But if you remain theoretical and you you don't really take the risks or put your ego on the line, um, then, then you haven't really done anything. <laughs> and you can't really talk about anything because you don't know. And I think that that's quite important, you know. Yeah, I, I also read how, you know, some will live a safe life, a safe life, you know, the classic, the librarian who just, you know, works through the day and goes home and feeds the cat and gets up and does it again. And not to say you can't find, you know, enlightenment or, or in, in the simplicity of life, there's value in the simplicity. I understand that much. But I, this word risk is really intriguing 
because even getting going out the door now, it, you're taking a risk to go traveling. <laughs> you're taking a risk, but it's invigorating and it's inspiring. Um, when, uh, like last, uh, I think earlier this year, uh, the Peace Village was wanting to have the first um, BK retreat or gathering to celebrate a special occasion. And then when it came out that the numbers were going up on the COVID, um, then everybody backed out. Oh, I'm not going. I mean, so many were saying, yes, let's go. I can't wait to connect, to be part of community. That's a value. That's mm -hmm. important. These things that are important. And because of some surgery and whatnot, um, I had been away from that connection for too long. And I said, well, I'm coming anyway. One school of thought would be, that's really dumb. <laughs> And another school of thought would be, wow, good for you. But by being that instrument to come, then everybody else came. Nice. In spite of the odds. But I was just following my heart. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I would be protected. I just had this instinct. Um, However, I can look back and see where I have taken risks. And because it was ego ba based, and I can tell you one, a real good one, <laughs> and it cost a pretty penny. And I had the signs along the way, but I kept ignoring it saying, no, I'm, I'm 60. I want to do this. I've got to, I'm getting old. I want to prove myself to the world. And then it just flopped. <laughs> Yeah. So how do you now I'm with all that said, uh, Denise, Ben, how do you discern or is or is that just part of the way of skinning your knees sometimes and then getting the gold star sometimes? Um, how do you discern and not lose that connection with that um, joy for life, that that connection with God? Um, and you know, enjoying life. Well, it, it seems to me that it really does depend on your priorities, your values. And um, for me, I, I think about things like, is it needed? Is it um, what will happen? Is it beneficial? Is it meaningful these type of things because I, i'm very very interested in truth it's a vague term even though but um when i make decisions very often i make them very intuitively and sometimes people will say quite irrationally but yet um when i do that i find with hindsight that it was the right thing to do because of how it played out so that makes me trust my judgment and my intuition and I get a lot out of it because when you do what feels right and it turns out to be very good from the angle of hindsight and from the angle of it's meaningful and it's part of something that's leading to somewhere else, which is where you really want to go. And it all comes back to who you are. Uh, yeah, I, I think what you do doesn't define who you are, but it does reflect who you are. And if you're operating from, you know, you, you mentioned about if you do something out of ego, it doesn't work too well. Um, but there's another... Uh, level of the self which is your um your pure inner honor of the self you know the self-regard the self-honor who you really are and to do things to um reflect that and that reveal that i think is a very good reason and i think that your discrimination 
um, comes from your priorities um, because you're evaluating things and um, this is where the question of your values comes your values your priorities what is important for you and um, I think it's very good for people to really sit down and see the difference between you know are you doing something out of ego or are you doing something out of the essential self that you are and when you ask these questions to yourself, you can come up with signs of ego and signs of true self-regard, which you can um, sort of analyze in terms of how you feel about what you did afterwards. Did it pan out in a way that reflects your higher self in a way? because the ego is always called also the false ego and if you do something out of ego i think there will be a message coming which will tell you that hey you know what was that that wasn't real that wasn't meaningful that didn't make any sense and so you acquire experience through all of these processes you know and you arrive at wisdom eventually this is why i think you have to always be ready to embrace something new uh, take a a risk a calculated risk as well as you can calculate gonna always calculate everything um but um Without that, you're not accumulating experience. And I think wisdom is the final result of a lot of accumulated experience. And then you have value as a person, which makes you also feel very good that you, it is meaningful to be you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I believe that we will attract to us <laughs> knowingly or unknowingly the lessons that will help me reveal that inner beauty or that self-worth where mm -hmm. i i really have a sense of myself mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's interesting how we even attract these challenges we even attract the defeats as well as attract the victories if we use that same principle isn't that the same yeah I, I think so. Karmically so. speaking, mm, mm. we will attract that which we dread or fear. And <laughs> we will. <laughs> because we're consumed with that thinking, or we will attract that which we love and uh, aspire to. And I think both will reveal that inner truth. Um, because I remember when you were saying about beauty and truth. And when you're an instrument of that, you know, in the Greek times, they would call that a genie. That they believed that a genie made them do it, create that beauty <laughs> or that intelligence, that work of art. And so they entertained themselves with that thought. And then once they started saying, no, I'm the genie. And they call, so genius came from this term, the genie. Mm. And so, oh, he's a genius, but they'd say, oh, no, no, I have a genie. <laughs> and how I interpret that is that the spiritual influence to be able to channel something of beauty or truth that perhaps you hadn't um, calculated it or um, like you were saying, your reason is one thing, and then there's an intuitive intelligence mm -hmm. that attracts also or um, challenges you. Um, how, how can, I guess where I'm going with this, uh, Denise, is navigating through this. And you do have to take a risk if you're gonna ride the white waters, Make sure you've got a life jacket, <laughs> you've got a boat, and you learn along the way. And, um, and I think greatness 
is very attractive, but it's it's not necessarily um, with um, a, a pageantry and um, loud sound. It's it's something that can be very sweet and simple and um, fulfilling. Um, yeah, and discreet. Hmm. Discreet in that it's not um, playing its own trumpet, it's just there. And we have a question here, um, Sister Denise, how can we use the law of attraction to manifest positive change in our life? If all this existence is Maya, how do we transform darkness into light? Well, you have to take a look at these premises, and um, I would not say all of this existence is Maya, number one. There are many people who classify it like that, but I don't, so I would challenge that premise, and I would say that this is real, and it's material, and there are many deceptive things in it, but we cannot say that it's not real. It is real, but um, you need to discern when it presents itself as something other than what it really is, because there is deception and um, our perception is um, insufficient if we use only the two eyes. And so in India, we speak about the third eye, which is able to see the reality um, behind the, um, the illusions. And then you're not deceived, which is very good. Then you can discern. But the eye, the third eye, is the eye of understanding, the eye of spiritual knowledge, the eye of wisdom. And that is something that is developed. Um, you can say that experience and depth of perception, all of that um, gives you a, a greater um, level of reality than just superficial reality. So um, there's a saying that no one can deceive you uh, unless you let them. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm trying to find the steps uh, of discernment, you know, navigating uh, through these different attractions or repulsions to the pairs of opposites and not to be swayed um, by the dark or the light. I don't know if that makes sense because we're drawn to the light. Okay, yes, go ahead. I was gonna say that you, it, the person who cannot be deceived is the honest person. And the honest person is not the same as the naive person. A naive person will be deceived as well as a dishonest person will be deceived. But the honest person who's clear, sees clearly, is not going to be deceived. So then you will make choices that correspond to something which is genuine and coherent and consistent and corresponds to who you are, which is very different from something which um, is, is there to massage your ego because that will really deceive you. And uh, I think that your uh, compass, sometimes people talk about a moral compass, but the compass needed is the compass that will select something that corresponds to the real essence of who you are mm. and not the... Um, the things that are ego-based, you see, that's the key. Thank you. You actually answered the question for me. Um, and 
actually I really resonate with anything that gives the soul that confidence to be who they are, mm. no matter what the challenges are, or even what the um, the beauty or the fun or the and what might be enticing or the adrenaline rush, um, but not to lose oneself in either. And I'm so what I'm hearing from you is honesty and truthfulness 